uh, candidly, the only thing that's why the Russians have been willing to try to find a negotiated solution. But now we've pushed them past their point of patience, I fear. The only thing that's going to make the United States ever learn to approach war like the Russians do is we're going to have to lose about 10 million people. 10 million dead. All of a sudden, our taste for war might finally get go away. But the and so it's going to make it more difficult for Israel to borrow money. The reality is Israel is entirely dependent upon the U.S. and money from the United States. And if anything happens to disrupt that flow, Israel is sunk. Larry, with the current situation of the Ukrainian army, you've written a very important piece on your website, sonar21.com, and you are describing the level of casualties right now comparing to last year. And could you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a math problem for Ukraine. Uh, last year, in r- roughly this time, say in June of 2022, uh, going into July, this is when, you know, remember Ukraine had started this new counteroffensive to drive to Crimea. They were going to be bathing in the Black Sea by end of August, so they said. Ministry, Russian Ministry of Defense reported on average around 700 killed in action, wounded in action on the Ukrainian side. Well, now, jump ahead, they're reporting three times that amount. Uh, a little over 2,000. So, and and part of the reason for that is, one, uh, the, the Ukrainians now uh, are putting more untrained personnel on the front lines, and Russia has stepped up the intensity of its attack. Uh, previously, you know, a year ago, Russia was more or less on the defensive. They were letting the Ukrainians rush up against them. They were able to shoot back and You know, they didn't carry out many offensive operations. Now they're on the offensive. But they, uh, and and, in response to that, the the Ukrainians are uh, trying to step up their attacks in Kursk in particular. And they're they're just taking some horrific casualties, you know. And this is what I listen to some of these, you know, people online there's this one guy called it. He got the history legends, Alex something. I don't know what his dysfunction is. I mean, he really, it just, he, the more I, the, when I watch him and the, listen to him, it just irritates the hell out of me because on the one hand, he'll say, Oh, Russia's pounding Ukraine. And then it both be like two thirds of the video is about how bad the, the Ukraine, the Russians are suffering at the hands of the Ukrainians. And it's like, you know, get your story straight, dude, which is it? Uh, he says, oh, Russia's Russian troops may be exhausted. No, Russian troops are not exhausted. The entire pipeline, if you compare what Ukraine's got going with what uh, Russia has, Russia is recruiting thirty to 40,000 people a month voluntarily. These people are walking in, signing up. Hey, I'm going to be all that I can be. And then... They go away to training. They're not, they're not shoved into the back of some trunk of a car or the back of a van and is, you know, being drug off against their will, like what's happening in Ukraine. They voluntarily, they show up at the bus station or the train station or wherever, and then they're taken to a base. And then they go through three, yeah, really, it's more like six months of training. They're trained both how to operated within a military unit. They're trained how to handle uh, a variety of weapon systems, depending upon what their specialty is. Some are trained to handle drones, but they're trained. They're not just, you know, given a cursory, ah, here's your uniform, Here, here's a rifle, see if you know how to work it, and you're leaving for the front tomorrow. That's what Ukraine does. So, with Ukraine suffering these losses, and, and every every military has to be prepared for losing personnel. I mean, the Russians aren't immune to it. The Russians have had uh, uh, killed 
probably over 70, 80,000 killed in action in the course of the last two and a half years. That's a, that's a lot of people, of, especially for those families that have lost loved ones. But it pales in comparison to Ukrainian losses. I know from uh, Andrei Martyanov, his estimated real in excess of a million dead. And I think he's exactly right. Can I prove that? No, but you got sort of indirect proof by looking at just the, the uh, imbalance in terms of fires. Like for every one artillery shell fired by Ukraine, uh, the Russians are firing six, seven, eight back. That's just, again, there, there's a math problem. <clears throat> if you're firing a, a hundred rounds at me and I'm firing a thousand rounds at you, who's more likely to get hit? You are, not me. And the more people you have, it means the more casualties you're going to suffer on, on that front. So this is what you, you, you've got. The, the Ukrainian army, it's, it's the equivalent. It's like bleeding out. You have cut an artery, and unless you stop that blood flow, you die. The, the Ukrainian army is in the process of dying. That, you know, that's what's taking place. And a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that or uh, admit to it. Uh, but, you know, you can see that this is where it's headed. It's not, it's not going to change because Ukraine doesn't have the ability to go out and, and enlist 30,000 people a month and then put them in a secure area where they can train for three to six months and then be ready. And even after the end of that training, understand you're still green. You're still inexperienced because there's nothing in training that can actually prepare you for the realities of combat on this modern battlefield. And that's where when you show up in a new unit as a green recruit, hopefully you've got some experienced people with some gray hair there who survived, who, who can help you learn the ropes, learn what to do, what, you know, how to survive, what not to do to uh, endanger yourself or others. Ukrainians, they don't have that. And they're not going to get it. It's not going to matter. You can't just, you know, get out a Harry Potter wand and sprinkle on some angel dust and magically appear. It's not going to happen. And do we know these new soldiers are getting trained by mercenaries or by Ukrainian themselves? It's a combination. In, in many cases, they're not getting trained. The, you know, the, they're literally grabbed, shoved into a, a some some facility somewhere where they can get be issued in a uniform and maybe a firearm, and then boom, they're, they're sent off to the front within a week or two. The, there are some that have been trained in bases in Romania and in Poland and in uh, the United Kingdom and Great Britain. But uh, you know, there's there hasn't been one consistent special area for that training to occur in because, frankly, of the bases... Every base inside Ukraine is a target and can be hit. You know, the Russians demonstrated that back in March 2022 when they, they hit uh, Yavariv, this de facto NATO base. It was, it was a NATO base for all practical purposes. And uh, they, they, the Russians hit that, you know, uh, two and a half years ago. So... You know, we're, if you're a Ukrainian and you're going to be, quote, recruited, the last thing you want to be is put in a place where you got, you know, 5,000 recruits marching around. They can be hit and killed. So you got to get them out of the country. And they're, where are you going to send them? And even if you send them to Romania or to Poland or to Britain, they're getting three different types of instruction. There's no, there's no uniformity in it. Remember that? That's one of those things. You join a military organization, you get issued a uniform. That means you, everybody looks the same. They don't get to accessorize. You, you know, you don't get to, you know, pick and clue, choose your color of the day. The reason for that is you want you want everybody to be operating in that other word, unison. You want them just like a, a choir. You've got different voices. You got the altos, sopranos, the tenors, the basses. But hey, when they come together, they're in unison, working as one. And so, when you've got one kind of training in Poland and one kind of training in Romania 
and one kind of training in Germany and another kind of training uh, in England. And, yeah, it's four different types. Then you come together and everyone's got a, like a sort of a different way of doing things. Which, when you're in combat, that's the very last thing you want to do is, you know, have three or four different ways of doing things. You want one thing. I mean, look, it, it applies to like firearms training. So when I, when I teach people how to use a semi-automatic pistol, I, when I, I said, you know, always handle the gun the same way. So you pick it up with your strong hand. And then if you have to load a magazine, you do it up here in front of your face. You don't look down. And you, so a lot of people that go to the range and they'll be looking down and put the mag, and then they come up and the, you learn a bad habit. So what my point is, if any kind of training, particularly firearms, you want to train one way. That if you're in combat, you're only having to think about one thing, how to keep the gun in a safe direction or pointed at what you want to shoot so you don't shoot your friends and colleagues or fellow soldiers. Well, you don't, I can't just um, tell you about it and you'll automatically be able to do it. It's the same way of, uh, you know, uh, another way I've, I've taught people where they shoot with one hand only and then they have to switch hands. Well, there's, there's a particular way to do that. And, and I was uh, working with a, a 30-year-old guy the other day in a defensive pistol class, and he's getting ready to join the FBI. And the, one of the tests on the FBI is you got to shoot with one hand and then switch to the other hand to get a total of six shots off in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, three seconds, I believe it is. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty fast. Oh, no, six shots in six seconds. But anyway, as he was trying to do that, he kept, you know, kept, he, he was having trouble learning. It wasn't, it took him, it took about five minutes and then all of a sudden he got it. You know, I'm going on about this training portion because people don't understand how important it is that when you're a soldier on a front line and you're in the trench and you're expecting the enemy to come at you from the front, and then you got soldiers to your right and left. All of a sudden, you get an attack from, say, your left side. What do you do? Do you turn immediately and start shooting? Because all of a sudden, you may have five or six shoulder, soldiers right there in your line of fire. So, God, you, gotta, you don't want to shoot them in the back of the head. So you got to make sure that you've trained for that. You've trained that if you got an attack from another direction that you're not expecting, how do you rearrange yourselves and move? Well. That's not just you as an individual. That's you as a group. So you can put people out there and you can run through this as an exercise. But I guarantee you when it happens real world, a lot of times when people thought that they had trained to remember, they forget. So the, the, all of that comes together right now with this uh, the, the combat operations that are underway, where you've got on the Ukrainian side relatively inexperienced people who don't know necessarily – how to take cover. That means hiding behind something that has some ability to stop a bullet from penetrating uh, as opposed to concealment. Concealment means you can hide yourself, but they could still, you know, you could pretend that you're a bush, have leaves and branches, but you can still, somebody can still shoot you. Whereas if you're hiding behind a stone wall and you know, they're shooting, uh, you know, regular AK-47 ammo at you, you know, you'd be pretty, you'd be safe. And you might get some uh, shrapnel off the rocks. Just the, the la that lack of training, that's one of the things that's killing a lot of Ukrainians. Yeah. Larry, right now we had a new article in the New York Times. They're talking about the mystery behind these jets crash. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is, this is hilarious. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. When they're talking about mystery, we know that it wasn't Russians who did this. It seems that somebody in the Ukrainian. Yeah. Part. Well, you, you've heard my theory, right? I actually believe Zelensky did it. And the reason why he understood that the Russians were going to pay a big monetary cash reward for the first one to destroy an F-16. So he's going, great, man, I blow it up. I get the money. <laughs> So that's one possibility. 
then the other possibility is uh, the pilot was climbing into his plane as the Russian missiles hit the base. Boom, no more plane, no more pilot. Or another explanation, let's go with the Ukrainian official version, so-called. The pilot was up to shooting down Russian missiles and the Ukrainians or mercenaries operating the Patriot battle battery didn't identify, didn't recognize the F-16 as one of their own, so they shot it down. Uh, one of the few times we've seen the uh, the Patriot missile battery be effective, you know. <laughs> Normally, it's missing the Russian missiles and fall and then falling back to Earth and blowing up a school in Kiev or someplace, uh, or that the pilot was uh, he panicked while flying and crashed the plane, you know, uh, swerved at the wrong time. You know, who knows? the The only thing we know for sure. Another one bites the dust. That's one less F-16 up there. And it's going to be part of a continuing story. They're going to lose more if they, if they take off. Even if they don't take off, if they're, if they're stored anywhere inside Ukraine, Russians are going to find them and blow them up. Do we know how many F-16s they have received so far? Supposedly six. They received six. They're now down to five. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the, 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 again, game changer? No. Um, it is. It, it changes nothing, other than uh, creates a, a, a causes belly for the Russians, because the F sixteen is capable of carrying a nuclear tipped warhead, and the Russians. If you're a Russian military planner, you have to assume the worst. You don't assume, oh, those Americans, they're never going to do that. Uh, because I just read a, a story uh, today. Uh, it was written by, it was published by this knucklehead named Michael Rubin. Uh, I think it was the National uh, Interest Stand by. Let me just see if I can find it. I want to. I want to be able to uh, flag it to you and your uh, readers and listeners. I mean, th this shows you just how sick, twisted, off base uh, the United States is. Um, uh, where'd you go here? Sonar. There we go. Yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, it's uh, for the, the Institute, the director for the Institute of International Strategic Studies. And his name is Michael Rubin. And I, I was going to I'm going to write on this uh, later today. It's the American Enterprise Institute, AEI. So it's one of these Washington, D.C. think tanks. And basically, he's saying that because Russia has not turned Kiev into rubble, because they're still building standing, he's basically saying that the Russians are pussies, that the Russians, they talk big, but they're not going to do anything. <clears throat> so uh, the Russians just need to be taught a lesson. And so... Uh, the, 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 what he's encouraging Japan to also get involved with attacking Russia because the Russians took Japanese territory from years ago. And uh, so therefore it's time for Japan to get its own territory back. I, I mean, we're, we're talking a level of insanity among people at these think tanks in the United States that uh, is it would have been impossible for me to have imagined even five years ago. They, they are literally divorced from reality. Uh, so they're saying that uh, we've got to, we've got to, that Russia is this, they, they portray Russia as this imperial power who's been out grabbing land. And as I recall, 
It wasn't Russia that invaded Iraq twice or invaded Afghanistan in the last 40 years. Yeah, Russia Russia went in into Af- Af- Afghanistan in 1980 at the invitation uh, of the government fighting back against uh, uh, an Islamic insurgency. Huh, where we've heard that before. But since the creation, since Russia became Russia and not no longer the Soviet Union, Russia hasn't been out invading other con- countries and taking territory like the United States has, like Britain has. So, just again, the hypocrisy on this is just staggering. Yeah, when Larry, when we look at the attitude of Russia, if you look at how they have responded to the escalation coming from the West, from NATO and Ukrainians, we have seen the sabotage of North Sea Pipeline. And we had the attack on Crimean Bridge, yeah, attack Kirch. on nuclear power plants in Zaporizhia and right now in the Kursk region. And Russia understands totally what's going on with the West. They, I, In my opinion, they don't hesitate if something goes up, if one of these F-16s, they, they would think that they're going to have a nuclear bomb on these F-16s because they are capable of doing this when yeah. you look at all of these <coughs> things together. No, I agree with you. I, I think that, that's why that's what makes this so dangerous. The miscalculation, not on the part of the Russians, but the miscalculation on the part of the West. Now, uh, Putin... Uh, you know, I, I will put the blame on Putin if you want to call it blame, because there are some in the Russian military and political establishment that accuse him of being too soft. And, and now, so I know you, you've been with an engineering background, scientific background. You're pretty good with logic. So maybe you can explain this logic to me. The West is obsessed with getting rid of Vladimir Putin. If we can overthrow Vladimir Putin, things will be better in Russia. I'm going, really? Putin's the one sitting there saying, guys, let's not start a nuclear war. Let's keep this measured. Let's keep this in, in our control. Let's endure with some of these insults because we're going to continue to move forward and defeat them but we're not going to wind up exchanging nuclear weapons. Let's try to let's take a big, deep breath. So we replace Putin and Medvedev comes in. Does anybody listen to that guy? He's not Mr. Calm, cool, collected. Uh, he's sort of dirt, dirty, hairy. You know, let's call him the Russian version of dirty, hairy. You know, go ahead and make my day. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, that's that. I mean, that is this the Western strategy? Replace Putin with somebody who's going to be worse, more violent, more quick to react, more emotional. I mean, the reality is, if Putin is forced out, they're not going to bring in Mahatma Gandhi, okay? They're not going to go out and dig up Mother Teresa, bring her back to life. They're not going to have somebody who's weak, somebody who is easily controlled, who's an alcoholic or dry. They're not going to do that. It's going to be somebody who's strong and decisive, at least, you know, projects power, which means, you know, the West is going to be facing a, a military fight that the West cannot sustain. I mean, that's the point. Uh, it's nice that, you know, I'm 69 years old, soon to be 70. I can sit around and fantasize all I want about being in, in, the, in, the, in a cage fight with some 23-year-old. But the reality is, physically, if I tried to do that, I, you know, I'd, they'd wipe the floor with me. Doesn't matter how strong I am now or even how much I exercise and work out. Just that age difference creates some limitations. So here, the West is so divorced from reality right now, it is alarming. 
Because it's not just the Democrats, it's the Republicans too. And I'll include Trump in that. I mean, there's, yeah, they're going to stop the war in Ukraine. But, you know, they're going to continue the war in, uh, against the Palestinians. So this, you know, this world sitting here teetering on, on the edge of a nuclear conflict, it's, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Larry, we are witnessing right now two different mindsets. I don't know if we can call it Eastern mindset and Western mindset, because on the part of Russians, it seems that as much as they, they're winning on the battlefield, they don't talk about it. They don't show that because at the end of the day, they are the one who wants to negotiate before this Kursk incursion happening. And on the part of the West, you see the to a totally different manner. They, they're thinking that if Russia wants to negotiate, they're afraid of NATO. They're afraid of Ukrainians. They're afraid of what's going on on the battlefield. This is, I think this, they cannot understand each other. That's why we are having a big problem between NATO and Russia. Two totally different mindsets are fighting each other. Well, and it's, it is explained, I think, very simply by uh, the legacy of World War II, the Great Patriotic War. And we've talked about this before. It, the Russians in that war, out of every 100 people, 16 were killed. And probably another 20. So think, think well, over one third of the Russian population were casualties in one way or another in that war. Which is why the Russians have not been eager to go to war. They understand the human cost of it. They understand that. It's some, that's why, you know, we're coming up uh, just a few months back in May when they did the March of the Immortals, when they marched to commemorate the end of the Great Patriotic War. And you've got now kids in their 20s who are carrying the pictures of their great grandparents, of their great grandmother, great grandfather, who may have died in the war. Uh, and yet, you know, they died, they had children before they died, which is why that kid's able to carry it as a memory. But they remember, the West hasn't suffered. We made money off of World War II. We got rich off of World War II in the United States. It was good for us. Yeah, we lost 470,000 people. Bah. Out of, at, when, you, when you do the numbers, based upon the population at the time, that worked out to less, less than one person killed per hundred. Less than one. It was, it was like a percentage. So out of if one is your number, 20% of one. Okay? That's what America lost in that war. War is good for us. So that's why we're trying to provoke this. And uh, candidly, the only thing, that's why... The Russians have been willing to try to find a negotiated solution. But now we've pushed them past their point of patience, I fear. The only thing that's going to make the United States ever learn to approach war like the Russians do is we're going to have to lose about 10 million people. 10 million dead. All of a sudden, our taste for war might finally get go away. But, the, you know, we, we've, we're good at hurting other people. We don't suffer much at all. Good God, look, you know, we combined with the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. So from 2001 up to, you know, say 2021, I think the United States total killed in action in both countries. Less than 5,000. I mean, good God, we we lose um, probably, if you, if you take the murder rates out of Chicago, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, you know, they blow those numbers away every year in one year. So, ah, yeah, you know, we get to bury some new people at Arlington. We get to do some emotional, patriotic crap about 
of waving the flag and proud to be an American and all oh, the look at their sacrifice. And for what? We ended up killing tens of thousands of Afghans and, and Iraqis, civilians, not fighters, civilians or people defending their homes. And, and we get, again, we make money off of it. That, I mean, that's what uh, Smedley Butler was right, boy. War is a grift. It's a racket. Yeah. It seems that, do you think right now the situation in the European Union is so interesting? The Netherlands is talking about, the government in Netherlands is talking about, doesn't matter what's going on in the United States, we're going to support Ukraine. And he was... <laughs> Good. How, hey. how did they have to offer to Ukraine if the, the United States is not willing, if Trump wins and the United States decides to not support Ukraine? How are they going to help Ukraine, specifically well, Netherlands? Yeah. Uh, send them some wooden shoes. I don't know. You know, <laughs> go build a couple of windmills. Uh, I mean, you know, the Dutch. You know, the, the, there's an expression in the Midwest, pimple on a gnat's ass. That's the Netherlands. They're, they're an irrelevant little country. They're not a, they're, there was a time when they were a powerful ec economic force uh, that had to be reckoned with. But we're talking in the 1600s, 1700s. Remember the United States, uh, the, the, what was then the beginning of the United States, the American colonies, John Adams is over there begging the Dutch for some money and the Dutch were financing wars. Should be a lesson in that maybe for America. You know, preview of coming attractions that you can go back when the Netherlands was once a power and they frittered away, frittered away a lot of their power by financing foreign wars. You know, they got involved with colonial activities. And instead of building a strong nation, uh, but they, you know, they didn't have the natural resources to really be a player in the modern world. Uh, but, but look, the, the, this so-called support for Ukraine, man, it's starting to disappear. You've had, you've had word out of Poland. You've had word out of Germany. Germany's, oh, we're not going to be paying so much more. And with the elections that just took place in Germany, with the IF day, uh, the AFD is it's uh, an English uh, party, uh, at least getting a, a small uh, a plurality anyway in this, a couple of the elections. And they, they made a good showing. Uh, now they're still uh, going to be shut out by uh, the other parties are so terrified of them. But like I said, you got these growing divisions in France, in Germany. Uh, not in Hungary, actually, ironically, despite all Western attempts to stir that up, um, but uh, also in Poland. Uh, you've had the deputy defense minister made a statement about, hey, we're not going to waste Polish uh, air defense systems shooting down Russian missiles in Ukraine. And then you had Sikorsky, you know, that tool, who's married to Ann Applebaum. And, uh, you know, talk about a neoconservative jerk. Uh, he was said, "Oh no, no, we're we're going to shoot him down." You know, he he's really Mister Bellicose. He can't wait to have somebody else go fight a war with the Russians that he's not willing to fight. But the divisions in NATO are, are starting to open up. So, yeah, all these rhetorical flourishes. Same with the Brits. We're going to support the Ukrainians to the last man. Well, they'll guess what? The last man's here because Britain's economic situation is bad, and it's only going to get worse. And as it as you know, they're already suffering un unprecedented levels of poverty, uh, at least in recent memory, in the UK. And yet they're wasting resources and funding uh, uh, the king of cocaine in Kiev uh, with uh, money that is winding up in real estate around the world. Yeah, not a good look. Yeah, but I think in the European Union they position of Germany is so important right now. The As you mentioned, the IFD, they're, they're asking for the resignation of Olaf Scholz right now. Yeah, It shows how important is the situation, how fragile is the situation in Germany. And if something happens in Germany, I think that would influence the whole Europe. 
Yeah, well, um, I, I think you're going to wind up with a stalemated situation there. I, I don't see Schultz and the, I mean, the green, they ought to go. But uh, I, I don't see them getting forced out anytime soon. The only, the only thing that will possibly make a difference is if uh, uh, when, when Russia finally defeats and destroys the, the Ukrainian government and military. Once that's done, then uh, the house cleaning can start in places like Germany, France, and the UK. But, uh, you know, right now, they're, they're, the, the Europeans are just obsessed with war fever. Again, they're not thinking rationally about it. How does, how does this benefit my country? How does this make me stronger, better? I mean, again, go back to the Netherlands. Yeah, they got Schiphol Airport. Okay, great. <laughs> but, you know, they're not even a leading economic force in Europe. They are a small country and a small contributor to NATO. You know, put the whole you know, Dutch army out there and, yeah, they, listen, they got some good officers and good soldiers, I'm sure. But they're tiny. They're not big. And, but they're they're acting like they're, they're fighting above their weight class. Larry, can we say that whoever did this, I don't know who's the strategist behind this curse <clears throat> incursion is in the United Kingdom, is the United States, but it doesn't, it seems that it was a very important moment because right after this attack, we are witnessing that the change, the, the, the battlefield is totally changing and the Russians are just advancing the, at the level that we haven't seen before. Yeah, well, the uh, once they pulled out some of their better units, and um, so I've seen I've seen contradictory reports. Some reports suggested that the Ukrainians pulled these units out well in advance, and and you know surreptitiously moved them into forests where they couldn't be seen, hit them out, and that they then launched the operation. But I, I saw other interviews with uh, soldiers that were captured. They claimed that they only got like a day or two in the warning. They were pulled out of Donetsk uh, region <clears throat> and then shipped up to Kursk and then thrown into battle. So who knows? Um, regardless that the, these troops that went into Kursk represented reserves in terms of so additional forces that could have been sent into uh, weak spots on the line in Donbass. And instead of doing that, they pulled them out and they were thrown into battle in Kursk. You know, we don't even have, you know, we don't have good order of battle numbers on this. We've heard everywhere from 12 to 30,000. Regardless of, uh, you know, regardless of how many, it is uh, they've been they've been they're taking major casualties. So and, and not just manpower, but in terms of equipment, number of tanks. I think it was well over seventy tanks have been destroyed by the Russians. Um, so this this left the Donbass incredibly weak. Where uh, you know it goes back to the training when you've got inexperienced soldiers that haven't been trained how to fight from defended positions and how to coordinate fire and how to do a variety of things that have to take place in a combined arms environment, they're getting out, they're getting out of the trenches and running away. Uh, so uh, the rush is actually capturing some cities entirely intact. You don't even see any shell craters around them. I mean, before they'd turn, you know, turn a city into a moonscape. You know, the, the population would evacuate generally or would hide out in basements until the Russians came through. But that hasn't been the case over the last uh, three weeks, four weeks. It's been really dramatic. Uh, I think the, the, the Russians have, have advanced something like 50, 60 kilometers. Let me, let me put it this way. If the Ukrainians had, had advanced this far during their counteroffensive a year ago, 
oh my God, the West would have been popping champagne bottles and the front pages would be celebrating the, the t- terrible beating that the Russians were taking, the great victory that the Ukrainians were achieving. But that's not what's going on here. It's just it's just the opposite. Yeah. The other thing, Larry, I talked with Colonel Jack Jack Bow. He was mentioning something so important that how the Ukrainian army is capable of integrating these weapons into the current strategy, current system that they're having. It doesn't seem they're receiving these aircraft they're receiving these weapons but they don't know how to use it here comes to the training process but it's a systematic problem that they cannot do the strategy based on based on these weapons well yeah um and let's put it in a simpler term that i think most people will understand just think of uh car parts okay so you're running a business where you have delivery drivers But instead of buying only one type of vehicle, instead of buying just Toyotas or uh, Kias or uh, Fords or Chevys, just one type, because why would you want, well, if if you get like Amazon, you buy one kind of vehicle made by one kind of manufacturer because that's A, the parts to repair it, it's going to be easier to keep them maintained, number one. And number two, drivers know if they have to change vehicles, they're going to know exactly how to deal with it. Well, that's that's not what we're doing with the Ukrainians. We're giving them like six different kinds of vehicles, and they're not all like automobiles. Some some like uh, one's, one's a four-wheel drive car, uh, one's a, like a moped. Uh, one's a, a, a tractor uh, with, you know, that's uh, uh, it, it doesn't have an automatic gear. You, you've got to shift it manually. So all of a sudden you've complicated it in terms of parts to repair. You've complicated it in terms of being able to operate the systems, know how to operate all the systems. Because I guarantee you the uh, the British... And, you know, shoulder-fired anti-tank guided missile is quite different from the Javelin anti-tank guided missile. Not saying that you cannot learn to shoot both, but there are different procedures to follow. And you can, you know, and the same thing applies uh, to rifles. You know, are you going to give them a Western-styled assault rifle like an AR platform or an AK? They, they... they operate, you know, differently. They have different uh, systems for, you know, taking it. If you've got a, a mechanical problem with a gun, taking it apart. Again, you can learn that. I'm not saying it's impossible to learn, but it just adds a complication. So that's what, what the West has done. The, 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 this isn't the first time they've done stupid stuff like this. So, you know, here's my old guy CIA story. So back in the 1980s, when the United States was providing weapons to the Contras, the Nicaraguan Contras, there had been a ban on those weapons being delivered to the Contras, and Congress had prevented it. That ban was lifted. And so they set up uh, uh, an island off of the coast, uh, on an island off the coast of Honduras called Swan Island. That was going to be the delivery base. And, and the CIA, the guy in charge of the Central American Task Force, then Alan Fires, he bought the aircraft. He had all this money. He bought the aircraft that they were going to use to deliver weapons to the Contras. He bought five different kinds of planes. And I found out about this from a buddy of mine who was a logistics officer who was saying what a nightmare it was. Because if you got one kind of plane... Then it's easy, you got, it's easy to switch parts around, easy to get them, you know. And you're the mechanic. You only have to worry about how to fix one kind of plane. You got five, five different systems. So, you know, the CIA has been doing stupid stuff like that for, that was, you know, more than 40 years ago. 
And it looks like U.S. military has done something similar with Ukraine. I lost your voice there. Can you hear me? I I hear you now. You're back. Shifting the gear to the conflict in Israel, we have Israeli media, Walla, he's talking about the commander of Unit 8200, which is the largest information gathering unit in Israel Army, in Israeli Army, intends to announce the end of his duties in the coming weeks. And can we understand right now, Larry, what's the situation of the Israeli army? And are they totally in line with the Netanyahu administration or they're having their mind, they're having their strategy, they're not agreeing on each and everything with the Netanyahu administration? Yeah, no, there's there's clearly some trouble within the ranks. There, there, and there's a split between uh, the leadership of the army and maybe some of the more junior commanders. Uh, Not all are these religious Zionists that are really ultra extreme. People like Ben Gavir and Smotrich. Uh, The, you've you've got a, there is sort of an an older crowd, more experienced that are less ideologically driven. You know, the, they're more concerned about preserving Israel's security as opposed to wandering off into uh, seeing how much land they can scoop up in Gaza and the West Bank. So this, you know, we we talked about, I wrote about it a week or so ago, where you've had the head of Mossad, the head of Shin Bet. You know, Mossad is the foreign intelligence operation. Shin Bet's the internal. They've been they've been very opposed to Netanyahu. You've had spokesmen for the Israeli Defense Force uh, come out, our rear admiral, and admit that hey, we can't, you know, Hamas can't be defeated. It's an idea. It's not uh, it's not a military thing that you can capture, round up, and, and, and eliminate. So you've really got you know a big. I don't see how Israel can continue to operate effectively against Hamas and then Hezbollah with those kinds of divisions in its ranks. And what's happened now over the last two days since uh, the Israelis killed those six hostages, trying to blame it on Hamas. And, you know, Hamas is responsible to the extent that they took them hostage um, and were holding them. But it was Israel bombing of civilians that killed their own personnel. That's not the first time. The The protests in Tel Aviv against the government have grown in intensity, and they're calling for Netanyahu to be removed. Um, the, but there's a, there's a deep, deep split within the, the Israelis. I mean, there's a, there's a sizable, it may even be a majority of the population, that want to eradicate the Palestinians, exterminate them. You know, we're not talking about coexist. We're talking about eliminate, destroy. So, you know, with these kinds of resignations, like this guy resigning out of Unit 8200, they replace him with someone who's more of an extremist. I mean, it's like we talked about earlier. Now we'll get rid of Putin. All of our problems are gone. Really? So get rid of this guy. All the problems are gone. Not necessarily. And uh, it it would appear that uh, Hezbollah claimed that it hit uh, that base, which is just, uh, I guess, outside Tel Aviv. Uh, the, The Israelis denied it. But I think this is sort of further confirmation that Hezbollah did hit it. In fact, in one of those articles, an Israeli source confirmed that there were at least three strikes on that base. Uh, so the unit AT-8200 location, it's, it's comparable to Fort Meade in, in outside of Baltimore, just south of Baltimore, where the National Security Agency is located. The NSA, 8200 is there to collect communications. Pretty sophisticated, and they had pretty sophisticated capability. But uh, 
you've got you've got growing uh, and growing fissures between the officers and the politicians. If they could hit the bases without using their ballistic uh, their, their ballistic missiles, and <laughs> how does this? air defense system work in your opinion because it doesn't seem to be efficient it doesn't seem to no, work it's limited it, 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 it's basically Iron Dome is basically a patriot and it, it can shoot down some things you know it's not totally useless but uh, it's certainly not not equipped uh, the, you know the way it operates is if it's got an inbound target even if it's say a drone it's still going to fire two missiles to hit that and once you fire those missiles, then you got to reload the launcher tubes. And it's it's not like there is a great inventory of these things lying around. You know, Lockheed Martin makes 550 of them a year. <laughs> so, you know, uh, what, what was it that uh, Hezbollah claimed it fired 300 rockets and drones? So if Israel tried to shoot down every one of those, there's 600 Iron Dome missiles that would have been launched. You know, so in one day they use up what Lockheed Martin can produce in one year. That's not a good uh, rate of expenditure. You, you go broke on that real quick. Yeah. And the other part of, Larry, this conflict would be the economy of Israel right now. It doesn't seem that there are they are in a good shape right now. That's right. why many people are talking against this <clears throat> military operation, this attack on Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, the, the a lot. Some of the s numbers on the surface appear okay. That all oh, GDP is growing. Um, that the unemployment's low. But uh, there, there was an article uh, written the other day in Haaretz, and I posted it uh, a large uh, segment of it on my channel at sonar21.com, where the, the author, he goes through in detail what's, what's really taking place. And uh, um, part of it, you know, is Israelis losing population. Its population is declining, not increasing, and it's declining in part because a lot of people are getting out of there. They say, oh, this is too dangerous. We're not going to stay here. Boom. They leave. They go overseas. Uh, second, a large amount, a significant portion of the economic activity that's recorded as growth for Israel is actually from expenditures of Israelis who live outside of Israel. Well, that's not a good thing. Uh, third, some of the GDP growth is attributed to government spending what are they spending on? They're paying for hotels and restaurants for about 80,000 people that had to flee their homes up north. So this is, this is basically you're dealing with disaster assistance. And then you have all of these reservists who are poor, pulled off the line and uh, put into military service. Well, they can't run their business. And in the past... Several of the Israeli businesses relied upon relied on Palestinian workers to come over. You know, there there were some Palestinian Christians who would go over. The you know they were not not necessarily all Muslims, but even the Muslims would go over and work in Israel. Well, that's not happening now. So and then uh, the the Fitch rating bond rating agency downgraded uh, Israeli bonds two weeks ago. And so it's going to make it more difficult for Israel to borrow money. The reality is Israel is entirely dependent upon the U.S. and money from the United States. And if anything happens to disrupt that flow, Israel is sunk. 